Hello, I'm Megan Opie, Vice President of CADV's Board of Directors. Domestic violence impacts families. Many times we hear that children are not impacted by the domestic violence that occurred between their parents. The client documentary you will see shortly will outline how children are either directly or indirectly involved in the domestic violence and that it has lasting impact on their lives. Families become secretive and children are not able to talk about their thoughts and feelings related to the abuse they are witnessing. The home is where children first learn about emotional intelligence and in a home defined by domestic violence, the lesson is dysfunctional. In essence, the lessons are don't talk about what is going on, don't treat people with respect, don't have any feelings about what is happening, and the list could go on and on. Cindy will share her journey as the youngest child of four children born to an affluent family that was engulfed in violence. Cindy's parents are both deceased, her mother dying recently. This has opened the door for her to begin to share her journey in order to help herself and other victims who may have shared in the same experience. While we need to talk about this difficult topic to raise awareness, we realize it may be difficult for some viewers to hear. Please be sure to get support for yourself if you are feeling overwhelmed by the documentary. So I grew up in a house in the country um, that was recognized by many as being very, you know, very richy, very... Uh, very affluent. People just looked at us as being very rich and uh, like we had everything and everything was cool and you know boy wish you know they wish they were us and you know that's one thing I'd like to say is that is that I've learned not to judge. You don't really know what goes on behind closed doors and so I've just learned in my life not to judge people because you really don't know what's going on. My dad was <clears throat> known as being, you know, a very great businessman. He had three, 33 meat plants across the United States. He was at his height of success and, you know, just they were going to Vegas and just, just really playing it up. And I think he felt like he had the right to then use all of us as he wanted. You know, we were the landscapers, you know, we didn't have any hired help because, you know, we did all of that. Now, when I was younger, of course, I couldn't do much, but as I grew older, you know, we were either working or hiding from him or being abused, so that was our life. My mom, she was real good about having a smile on her face all the time, and I see her in pictures. Uh, going through all the pictures from the past, and she's always got a big, beautiful smile. Even <clears throat> with the picture where Roxanne, my older sister, he had, for some reason or another, cut her hair off. He just cut it, like, all the way up to here, just taking her beauty away from her. And he was, he was a woman hater, there's no doubt about that. Looking through all of the pictures, we just never looked happy. We were always just very sad and scared to death because most of the time he was taking the picture. So it's like, am I taking the picture right? You know, or, you know, what's going to happen next? Or, but he'd like to, you know, show people what a great family we were. We had everything, like I say, as kids, we had snowmobiles, mini bikes, trampoline, beautiful pool, everything that a kid would, could want, right? Well, no, <laughs> I would have traded that life for somebody else's life in a, in a second. Some of the abuse that I seen was uh, my father came to get us from our school and he was driving my sister's car. And immediately I was like, you know, he killed her because why would he be driving her car? And we got in, he says, I'm gonna take you home and you're gonna see what happens when you don't obey and when you're bad. And I found a bottle of perfume in her car and, you know, and she paid for that. And so we went home, he led us downstairs to her bedroom and there was a butcher knife on the bed, on her bed, bloody, and she wasn't there. So I still thought she was you know, something happened to her. <laughs> anyway, you just, you know, just, he was drunk, of course, and 
was urinating in her in her in her room, and I was, you know, just, you know, I'm still very young at this stage. Uh, I was maybe, well, I guess I was in school, so I don't know, six or seven, something like that. And then I learned that <clears throat> she was at the hospital with mom. Well, he had cut her head open, is what he had done. That was her punishment. And uh, so anyway, she got stitches, and she said they didn't ask any questions whatsoever. They just stitched her head and sent her, you know, and they all went home. So that was a real letdown for her, too, because she thought maybe, oh, this will be our, you know, her chance to tell them what's happening, and they'll come save us all. It didn't happen. It, I think back in those days, <clears throat> it was, sure, there's people that knew, our aunts and uncles, and teachers and doctors I think they they had to have known they just had to have known and uh, but it was more it was something that was okay I guess to me it was like well that it must be okay and I just had the dumb luck of having a monster for a dad you know it just this is the way it is and uh, we like I say we had everything that we wanted but you know we lived through lived in terror all the time and I was thinking about it and I was like I've really lived in terror 24 hours a day another instance that happened was this was later on and I was probably 12 we were out swimming and we heard some ruckus going on in the house and uh, he had her in the hallway there next to the pool he had just snapped and he was choking he had her down on the ground and he was choking her and he said I don't care I don't care if I go to jail I don't care if I do you know I'm killing you I don't, I don't care it's just like he just snapped you know like that and she got away from him somehow and she came out to the pool she said come on come on we gotta go so we're in our swimsuits and we went around the house to where the cars were and he had already been there to grab the keys out of the car. He was really very kind of psychic that way, um, always knowing her next move. At first he just kind of looked at her like he was kind of contemplating what he was going to do, like, like was he going to commit this abuse in front of us or, you know, you could tell he was thinking. And then all of a sudden he just grabbed her hair, like he snapped again, and he just grabbed her by the hair and he started grab pulling her into the house. And I said, I, was, I remember thinking, if I say something, maybe he'll stop. So I said, stop it, Dad. And he let go of her. And then we took off, we went <clears throat> running through the woods. And again, we have our swimsuits on and no shoes. And we're going through, <clears throat> fencing and you know it's the woods <clears throat> and we went to our cousin's house which was I don't know it was a couple of miles through the woods my dad's brother got a hold of him and and calmed him down and so that evening then we all went back home and it was supposed to be safe like he was calmed down so my mom suffered a lot of abuse there were a lot of black eyes a lot of fat lips and it was all about that he thought she was she was looking at a guy or she was talking to a guy too long or, you know, it was, it was all about uh, she just wasn't acting right. Mom and dad would go out and, and he would drink. He would out full-blown alcohol, like, you know, every other day he had a bottle of whiskey and, uh, and he would drink all the, the whole bottle. Uh, and then when they would come home from their evening, you know, he was drunk and he would be coming, you could hear his foot, his shoes coming down that hallway. And my brother's uh, bedroom was on the, the first one. And then my, my sister and I, our bedroom was the last one. And uh, so we would be in bed and we'd listen for those footsteps and see if where they were gonna stop. And many times he went into my brother's room and you know, you would hear the, just the ruckus of beating, you know, the screams or the, you know, just 
um, banging or you know what have you and and you would quietly hope that that would be the end that he wouldn't come into your room and decide that you were you needed some beating too. E.H., the one that suffered so much abuse when he was younger, Scott suffered, he was beaten too a lot, don't get me wrong, but E.H. really had the most severe beatings, and he passed when he was 30 from blood clots, and was it related to the abuse he suffered back then? Probably. My mom had a stroke when she was 50, uh, was that part of the abuse, that she, all that stress that she went through? She married him when she was, I think, early 20s, or, you know, 20, 22. And uh, he died when he was 49, which is very young. My dad had lung cancer. And uh, when we received word that he had cancer, that was a highlight in my life, you know. Um, and I felt bad about that because you're supposed to love your dad. But I felt kind of bad that I was like, whew, maybe he'll die. Maybe he'll go away. And he went in, he had one lung removed, and he, lived, he went on for about another eight months or so. And then finally, he died. And I remember still to this day, and standing there in the hospital, and they told us that he died. And I just thought to myself, I need to start crying or I need to look sad because that's what you should do. And so I got some tears coming, and, but I was so happy and so relieved as I'm sure everybody was. And in retrospect, after my mom passed, my brother and sister and I talked a lot about the abuse that went on and, and what all that mom went through to save us. And I was successful. It was kind of a rough go of it at first, but you know, finding a job and I was in management and I climbed the ladder and and I was doing really well. Now my boyfriend choices were not so good. They were abusive, mildly abusive at first, and then the last one was very, very, very abusive and he was also a woman hater you know, had me just like staring down at the ground all the time because he thought I was looking at somebody or probably the same thing my mom went through and he was very abusive. He would have either killed me or disfigured me. That was his plan he, and he told me that if I can't have you then nobody else can. So I went home and uh, escaped him and during the night and I remember coming home and my brother was standing there, E.H., and I was just covered in bruises. And uh, so f from there, and then my other brother, Scott, really helped me through all of that. He got my composure back and my esteem back. And then I got into real estate and all was good then. I had a child, Justin, that is a light of my life. And, um, <laughs> oh. I wanted a child because I wanted to be the best parent ever. I was <clears throat> very excited to be a mother, just, you know, to provide all the love and support and, uh, you know, just provide him with everything that he needed to feel secure and loved and to be successful in life. So I thought I could provide that for him. I had pretty much put my abuse away and had, you know, learned, you know, through books or whatever kind of material was available to me to deal with, with, um, with the abuse. Because obviously, obviously it affects you whether you think so or not. And uh, I was introduced to CADV through a friend. And uh, I thought, well, geez, you know, that's, I need to get involved there because I can help these people. I mean, because I've been through it. I survived it. I feel like I was successful in my life. And uh, I want to be there for somebody. That was the biggest thing. <laughs> so I, I learned from my friend that 
one of the ways to volunteer with CADV would be through SART, with this, which is Sexual Assault Response Team. And that is where a person, if you're, you, the volunteer is called to the hospital when there is a domestic or sexual, uh, sexual assault against a victim. And uh, that's part of what CADV does, is that the when the victim is received or is admitted, then their first call is to CADV. I was so thankful to be able to be that person they first met that was on their team and to tell them at CADV there is counselors, there's legal services, there's shelter, and these women are incredible and they will help you get back on the road to where you never have to go through that again. You never have to face violence again. And that is so powerful and it's such a important part of our community, which our community understands that. I mean, every year we see for a brunch, we see the partnership that we have with our community. And that's as a survivor that didn't have that. And like I seen even with the survivors that have that, we are all just so appreciative because it, it's not just the money and the funds, it's knowing that you have a community behind you. Because your abusers can be so powerful and you're, you just think, oh well, you know, you're still scared to death, okay? You're scared that they're gonna find you, they'll find a way in, and that you're still alone. It takes a while for you to realize that these people are your friends, that they're there to help you. They're your, they're part of your world now. It's not just the abuser in you. I want survivors to know that um, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, don't give up on yourself, and don't let that abuse define you. My telling my story right now is, is a sense of power for me over my dad. It's like, uh, yeah, you had control over me for several years, trying to ruin me. Um, he didn't uh, succeed at ruining the, the women or the girls in our family you know, because we found happiness and we found good men and, and, um, sorry. <laughs> no.